any point you guys need anything, throw it in the chat. We have one of our other tutors, Lainey. She's going to be kind of watching the chat, answering any questions that you might have. If you guys need me to slow down, just let me know. You can either unmute yourselves or you can throw it in the chat. The chat might be a little bit easier, though. So let's go ahead and get started. So what do I need to know? In patho, we've been taught every little detail of every little disease process that we're being covered. And it can be a little bit difficult. For the purposes of the midterm, I always kind of focus on my top um, three considerations. Number one, what is this? What am I learning about? How would I educate my patient? So you need to know the disease process enough to, to, enough to provide education. Let's say a... Um, mother was in um, and she was recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and the daughter comes up to you and says, my mom's liver is fine. Why is this happening? Well, we know that diabetes is actually an issue with the pancreas and insulin. So you would need to know the disease process of diabetes enough to explain it in easy to digest terms to your patient and their family. Also, what do we need to look out for? As nurses, we are constantly doing assessments on our patient. So for specific disease process, how would I incorporate that into my assessment? Or what assessment details would lead me to assume that my patient is suffering from something? So always think about your assessments, lab values, et cetera. And that kind of goes into your hallmark signs and symptoms. Again, almost all disease process um, kind of overlap with signs and symptoms, nausea, vomiting, et cetera. We really want those hallmark signs and symptoms. And then most importantly, how to provide patient-centered care. In this class, we're not going to teach you how to medically treat a lot of these diseases with medications, because um, that's really what we're going to learn in pharmacology and complex health one. But I always say that pathophysiology is our building block uh, for courses where when you progress through the nursing program, Patho is just going to be a little bit of piece of the whole equation, but it all builds, so it's really important to have an awesome understanding. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with our review session. So unit one. Unit one goes over um, genetics. So what genetic disorders in specific are we going to go over? Well, let's talk about trisomy 21. This is our Down syndrome. Basically, a patient has an extra chromosome on chromosome 21. Now remember, this is a type of aneuploidy. When you think aneuploidy, think abnormal number of chromosomes. Usually going to be an odd number. And we learned earlier about aneuploidy versus polyploidy, but aneuploidy is very compatible with life. However, these patients are going to have a couple symptoms associated with the disease process. They're really going to have some physical growth delays, some intellectual disabilities, characteristic facial features, um, and their single hand crease. So just kind of remembering those are like our hallmark signs and symptoms. Really, our cause is unknown, but there is a major genetic component. It's usually passed down from one parent, but in this case, it's usually passed down from the mother. So when we're thinking of education, well, how does this happen? Well, if we know it's passed down from the mother, it's strongly linked to being passed down from the mother, what factors put the mother at risk? Of course, family history is involved, but I'm thinking there's an issue with mom's egg. And we know with females, we produce all of our eggs prior to being born, which is why when we have mothers of advanced maternal age, they're at an increased risk for um, genetic disorders being passed on to their children. So I think Number one, factors that would put my, the mom's eggs at risk, I think that would be that advanced maternal age. But there's an array of factors, smoking, carcinogens, um, drugs, et cetera, illicit substances. So just think about that when we're talking about our genetic disorders. Up next is our Turner syndrome. Now, Turner syndrome only occurs in females. So females have um, an XX. Remember, chromosome 23, that's our sex chromosome. It determines um, if the patient's going to be a boy or a girl. Boys are XY, females are XX. But with 
these patients, they have a missing or deformed X chromosome. So they really only have one good X chromosome. Again, it's a, it's a livable disease, but you're going to see a lot of issues with these patients, usually when it comes to sexual maturation. So they're going to have issues with hearing, short stature, webbed neck, infertility. Again, kind of going hand in hand with our Down syndrome, what puts our mom's eggs at risk? So just thinking about that. And um, again, with Turner syndrome, sexual maturation, they're not going to have a period. They're going to have amenorrhea, absence of period. So they're going to be infertile. So that's a big thing um, that might require counseling as well. So when we talk about environment and epigenetics, basically at the top, the statement is my favorite statement, with identical genetic heritages, meaning identical twins, they might evolve differently depending on their environments. So our environment consists of the foods we eat, possible toxins, smoking, infections, increased um, stress, et cetera. So people with different environments might adapt and grow older with different diseases, different issues, et cetera. This is where epigenetics comes into play. It's how the environment interacts with our genes. So certain environmental stress and certain environmental issues can actually turn on or off some genes that can really impact our growth and our development. So think about industrial workers. They're constantly outside, their bodies put under a lot of stress, a lot of smoke inhalation, et cetera, they might be prone to certain types of respiratory disease, respiratory cancers, et cetera. A big one for this is bipolar disease. Um, people with mental illness, identical twins, one might undergo stress early in life. You talk about later ACEs, adverse child experiences, that is going to lead to, um, unfortunately, an increased risk of developing chronic disease. So keep that in mind as well. I listed out a couple type of um, important cellular adaptations. I'm not going to go too much into detail on these. This slide is here for you guys. Um, I would just really focus on kind of the top three are your most important. And when we start to talk about cardiac issues, hypertrophy is fine and well if I'm a bodybuilder <laughs> trying to grow my muscles. But when it comes to the organ, or especially the heart, we're really concerned about hypertrophy because the muscle is becoming thick and stiff. And certain muscles of our body really need to be smooth and flexible. So just keep that in mind. So cellular injury and apoptosis. Usually our cellular injuries are going to result um, from a hypoxic injury, a lack of oxygen within our cells. So the cell really has two things that can happen, um, which we'll talk about on the next slide. But essentially, if there's a hypoxic injury that causes massive cell damage, our cells, our body is very smart. It's going to recognize that these cells are not working. There's something wrong. I need to get rid of it. So apoptosis, this is our programmed cell death. And it really needs to happen to keep cellular replication in check. We know how if we go way back to the PMAP, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, our cells kind of just come together and then they, they keep replicating. But if I have a faulty cell and it replicates, it's going to replicate another faulty cell and that's not good. When we talk about cancer later this semester, apoptosis is uncontrolled. It's not happening. So these cells just keep going and going and going. So the cell really has two options, adapt, overcome, or apoptosis. So with cellular injury, we have necrosis and apoptosis. Uh, for the midterm, I would focus more on apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death, and it's consisted of um, the photo on the right, where the cell is going to shrink in size, form membrane blebs um, that end up branching off, and then it's reliant on phagocytes to kind of eat <laughs> those uh, blebs and dispose of them. So I would just kind of review apoptosis is really a program, whereas our necrosis, this is injury from an intrinsic factor. So necrosis happens from something environmental where apoptosis is our body's own response. And that's kind of how I like to differentiate the two.
So distribution of body fluids, this goes kind of into your dehydration lecture. Um, just remember, pediatrics are way more at risk for dehydration, why they have increased fluid reserves. With these increased fluid reserves, their bodies are so used to having a lot of water. If we don't have as much water, maybe it's even just a tiny amount, they their bodies freak out because they're they're so used to getting a lot of water. So I would remember uh, when we're assessing our patient, what assessment findings would indicate my patient is dehydrated and why? what are some possible causes? I need to identify the cause of my patient's dehydration so I'll know how to treat it. So again, review how we assess for our dehydration, that poor skin turgor, that tachycardia, that hypotension. Why hypotension? Well, fluids is a major factor in blood pressure. If we don't have enough fluid, we don't have a lot um, kind of pumping throughout our body. Whereas if we have fluid overload, which we'll talk about, we have hypertension. So just kind of keep in mind that the tachycardia is our body's response to the hypertension that's caused by dehydration. And really knowing what patients are going to be at risk for dehydration. We already talked about children, but also the elderly. They, not be, they may not be able to communicate that they're thirsty. Um, athletes, diabetics are a big one, trauma, burn patients. So just keep all of that in mind, knowing what am I assessing for? On the topic of uh, fluid reserves and water, ADH essentially is human vasopressin. What does vasopressin do? It just increases our blood pressure. So let's say our patient's dehydrated. My body's going to release ADH to hold on to whatever water we have left to try to increase our blood pressure. So this is produced in the hypothalamus and it really stays in that pituitary gland. It's released when our body senses that we have a drop in blood pressure. So what's going to happen? My blood pressure is low. My brain's going to release ADH and ADH acts to conserve water. Let's break it down. Antidiuretic hormone. Diuretic means pee. Anti-P. It stops you from peeing. Um, it stops the kidneys from being able to take that water um, from our body and flush it out. And this is what's going to help us raise our blood pressure. Um, your electrolyte imbalances are pretty important to know, so definitely recognize uh, what our normal lab values are. For sodium, we want between 135 and 145. Sodium has many important functions, um, such as active and passive transport, nerve and muscle tissue stimulation, etc. Um, and it's also highly influenced by water. When we have hyponatremia, we're having a lack of sodium. Now this can be caused by two things. It can be caused dietary wise, where we're just not consuming a lot of sodium, or it can be caused by fluid overload. The reason that um, hyponatremia can be caused by fluid overload, it's similar to the concept of if I have a packet of crystal light, and I pour it in a shot glass that has maybe two, three ounces of water in it, it's going to taste very salty. It's going to be very potent. But if I pour that same pack of crystal light into, let's say, a bathtub of water, I'm not really going to notice any of that flavor. That's kind of the concept. It's a ratio. So with hyponatremia, something is off. I either have too much fluid going on or I simply am just not consuming enough sodium. So certain disease process. SIADH is a big one, which we'll talk about, sweating, NG tube suctions, um, et cetera. So what are we concerned for? We're concerned for coma, anorexia, seizures, tachycardia, et cetera. Our hypernatremia, on the other hand, can either be caused by a loss of fluid or my patient has too much sodium. And remember, salt sucks. Where sodium goes, water flows. Um, so this is why these patients, even though they might be having a fluid loss, they're going to be big and bloated because their body's going to try to hold on to whatever they have left. So they're going to have that increased blood pressure, edema, dry, flush skin, thirsty, anxious, irritable, etc. And I also included just some little pictures for you guys. Again, you have the PDF copy for this. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. On the other hand, we have our potassium. I always like to start this slide off by saying salty bananas. We do not put salt on a banana. That would taste absolutely horrible. 
it's just why, why would you do that? It kind of helps you understand that sodium and potassium are inverse. If I have an increase in sodium, I'm going to have a decrease in potassium. They hate each other, they're inverses. So just remember that. Therefore, if my patient's hypernatremic, I'm concerned they're hypokalemic. So just kind of understanding the relationships between the two. So um, hypokalemia, usually this is going to be caused by our alkalosis. So if my patient has any sort of alkalosis, whether it be respiratory or metabolic, they're at risk for hypokalemia. And again, knowing your normal lab values. So with any issue with potassium, we're really concerned about the heart. Why potassium pumps the heart? If I have irregularities, my patient's probably going to be showing me some issues on the EKG. So just constantly monitor their cardiovascular function. Um, whereas our hyperkalemia, this is going to be caused by the opposite, acidosis. And just again, with those EKG changes, et cetera. And again, I put in another little photo for you guys to review afterwards. Kind of helps connect everything together. Um, ABGs, again, not going to spend too much time on these. Um, if you guys need help with ABGs, come see me in person. We can do some practice problems together. I think that's really the best way. There's great websites to do practice problems. Um, but I'll teach you kind of a little bit of the overview of our ABGs. 100% know your normal lab values. What is acidic? What is basic? Normal pH, my PaCO2, this is carbon dioxide. Remember, if we see something abnormal with our carbon dioxide, how do we get carbon dioxide? Well, we breathe in oxygen and we exhale CO2. So if I see something odd with my CO2, I'm thinking it's a respiratory problem. Bicarb, bicarb is a process, is released uh, via the process of metabolism. So if I have an oddity in my bicarb, I'm thinking possibly a metabolic issue. But no matter what, when we're interpreting an ABG, always look at your pH first. So acidosis. Metabolic, essentially, our body has too much hydrogen and not enough bicarb. Why? Bicarb is basic. Hydrogen is an acid. Causes can be DKA, malnutrition, diarrhea. I included some information on compensation, but again, if you're struggling with that, please come see me. I know um, at least I believe for your midterm, it's not really going to cover much of compensation, but just understand why it would occur. When we have respiratory acidosis, my body is holding on to too much CO2. And as we discussed, CO2 is acidic. So what patient population would be at risk for respiratory acidosis? Well, my COPD patients, patients that are on sedatives, why would sedatives be an issue? If my patient is sedated, they're not exhaling. And usually if my patient's on sedation, they might be receiving oxygen. So all that CO2 is going to build up. That kind of goes into the depressed breathing. So again, um, just review those. Whereas if we have our alkalosis, um, again, my body is creating too much bicarb if it's a metabolic issue. Again, if it's a respiratory issue, what could cause respiratory alkalosis? Well, my body's getting rid of too much carbon dioxide. I'm blowing off all the acid reserves I have, so now I'm alkalotic. So if my patient has an increased respiratory rate and they're hyperventilating, they're taking very small breaths in and really large breaths out, all that CO2 is leaving and I'm shifting to an alkalotic state. I also included a few more pictures just in case you guys are a little bit more visual uh, learners just for your convenience. So unit two is going to talk about our body's immunity and the immune response. So our immune system, we're really going to separate it into two. We have our innate immune response and our adaptive immune response. What is our innate immunity that we have? Well, our first and second lines of defense. First, meaning our physical barriers, our skin, our mucous membranes, my eyelashes preventing something from going in my eye. Those are all innate immune mechanisms. And then our second line of defense, inflammation and fever. So really important to know, in our innate immune response, these cells are nonspecific. They're not tailored to a pathogen. They produce a general response, and there's no memory. 
Whereas our adaptive immune response, this is when we start having our B cells, our T cells, um, when we do any sort of vaccines, when we get the flu, our body produces antibodies to that flu, and therefore it has memory. So really just understanding what cells are involved in each. I also included different types of immunity, um, active and passive. Again, review those because I think they're pretty important. So inflammation and fever, again, second line of defense. So what is this? It's our innate immunity. Um, keep in mind, it's got redness, heat, swelling, and pain. Um, fever, on the other hand, fever is systemic. Whereas if my patient's having inflammation, they're having heat, but in a localized area. So inflammation and fever are two separate things. So I also included kind of the phases of wounds and inflammation. So essentially the damaged tissues, they release histamine. What does histamine do? Histamine kind of sends the alarm. Everyone come over here, come over, help, etc. So all of my innate immune cells are going to go and respond. So again, um, capillaries become leaky, phagocytes, clotting factors all come uh, into the wound. Essentially phagocytes then digest and platelets help seal. So opportunistic infections, these are very rare infections that usually patients don't present with often. If you ever have a patient come up to you with um, an opportunistic infection, which I kind of included here, more of our rare diseases, we know that it's usually caused by um, immunocompromisation. So if my patient has is on immunosuppressants, if my patient is on corticosteroids, cancer patients, any patient with altered immunity is at risk for opportunistic infections, especially our HIV patients as well. And I think your book has a good chart of kind of all of the opportunistic infections. I know specifically um, like our hairy leukoplakia, thrush, etc. And then I also included some phases of wound healing, again, for some visual learners. Just keep in mind that in order to properly heal wounds, we have to have good nutrition, good hydration, and a healthy diet so that our bodies can heal and take care of themselves. I also included our antibodies. Um, these are... I kind of highlighted um, the most important parts of each. Um, I use the acronym GAME DAY, G-A-M-E-D, um, kind of goes down the line, specifically kind of what's colored. I would focus my uh, attention on why, because that's what makes them different. Blood groups, blood groups get a little bit interesting. So there's two factors to determining what blood type a patient has. First, we need to look at their specific blood group. Are they group A, group B, AB, or O? So just keep in mind, if my patient has type A blood, they have type, they have anti-B antibodies in their blood. So if I'm type A, I cannot receive type B blood because those antibodies are going to attack the type B. Vice versa, group B, if I have, if I receive A blood, my anti-A antibodies are going to attack that A blood. But my AB, uh, my patients that have AB blood, they can really receive A, B, or AB, as long as my rhesus factor matches, and we'll talk about that. Whereas our group O, unfortunately, they can only receive O blood. They, this is because they have anti-A and anti-B antibodies. Fortunately for everyone else, O negative, that's our universal receiver. So how do we differentiate if someone's positive or negative? we're gonna look at their rhesus factor. So rhesus factor is kind of, you have it or you don't. So if my patient has positive um, blood, they have no anti-D antibodies. But if I'm, let's say, A negative, I'm gonna have these anti-D antibodies. Therefore, if I receive blood that's positive, even if I receive um, A positive, but if I'm A negative, I can't receive that because, again, my body is going to attack that rhesus factor. 
So just keep in mind that when we talk about hemolytic disease of the newborn, this is when a mom with any type of blood that's negative um, elopes with a um, man that is type positive blood, I'm at risk that my, my baby could possibly have that positive blood type and my body's going to attack it. It usually only happens during the second pregnancy. This is why our moms receive a Rogam shot. So again, a good overview of our blood types. I also included our type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4 hypersensitivity reactions. Really knowing our type 1, this is our immediate allergic reaction. Anaphylaxis is type 1. Our type 2, this is antibody mediated. Um, so, you, so like we said, our blood transfusion reactions that we talked about in the slide earlier, those antibodies, those anti-A, anti-B, anti-D antibodies are attacking. Whereas our type 3 is very similar to our type 2, but it just involves immune complexes. So something's going to happen. Immune complexes are going to deposit at places in the body, and then our body's going to attack those immune complexes. Our type 4, this is the only one that's delayed. Usually the tuberculosis skin test, how we have to go back later or certain rashes to latex, metal, et cetera, over time we might develop these hives. Um, it usually requires though an initial infection to that antigen. Kind of flipping gears uh, to back to infections. How can organisms cause infection? Well, they need to have kind of all of these um, things. So again, I included definitions for you guys to review. Um, but essentially, what does a pathogen need? It has to be able to attach to the cell. It has to break down those protective barriers. It has to infect. It has to multiply. Um, and then it's got to escape from all of our body's kind of innate immunity, our skin, our pH, et cetera. So kind of just reviewing um, that. So stress and disease. We, when we talk about stress and disease, we're mainly talking about our HPA axis, our hypothalamus pituitary axis, um, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So basically, this is just a feedback loop that secretes CRH. So when my patient is under intense stress, my hypothalamus in my brain kind of lights up and it's going to release CRH. CRH travels um, down the brain from the hypothalamus to my anterior pituitary gland. My anterior pituitary gland is going to release ACTH. What does ACTH do? It binds to the kidneys. So it goes and it acts on the kidneys. The kidneys then release two of our major stress um, hormones, cortisol and aldosterone. So cortisol um, really is important when we talk about chronic stress because chronic um, release of norepinephrine and cortisol um, can put the patient's body under stress. If you've ever heard sick from stress, chronic stress really takes a toll on the body because the body, body is constantly secreting cortisol and catecholamines. What are our catecholamines? Epinephrine and norepinephrine are fight or flight. So if my body's constantly in fight or flight, it puts a lot of stress on the organs, specifically the heart. So just kind of reviewing um, that I think is important as well. This is why pain management is so important. Our body cannot differentiate what type of stress is happening. Am I stressed because of my midterm that's happening or am I stressed because I have an infection and a fever or am I just under stress because I had to go run from a bear and my body releases epinephrine and norepinephrine. So just keep those in mind. This is why stress management is very important. Unit four, pain. Pain is an overarching term that we can't really describe. Everyone has their own pain tolerances. Everyone has their own response to pain. This is why we always assess my patient on a scale from zero to 10, how bad is your pain? That's kind of how we're gonna gauge our treatment. But really we, we can't tell how much pain someone is in it is unique to the individual. We need to ask them about it. So always, you, you can't assume. You have to ask your patient. Um, we feel pain through the process of nociception. 
and pain can be differentiated into really two main groups, acute pain versus chronic pain. Chronic pain is really bad. Why we talked about our HPA access, we constantly putting the body under stress. We're releasing um, those glucocorticoids and epinephrine and norepinephrine, not good. I included the four phases of pain, um, not too important, but I would um, review and highlight the differences between neuropathic, acute, chronic, somatic, visceral, and referred pain. If my patient got a cut, what type of pain is that? If my heart is causing pain, what type of pain is that? So definitely I recommend reviewing it. So regulating temperature, how do we do that? Well, our hypothalamus and our endocrine system work together. Um, if we are hypothermic, my hypothalamus is going to conserve heat by stimulating our sympathetic nervous system, our fight or flight. Essentially though, um, blood is warmed in the center of the body closest to the heart, but it's still going to be shunted to the core. So if my patient is hypothermic, I'm concerned about their extremities because the extremities are kind of the first to go. Um, so really kind of understanding that. And then if my patient is hyperthermic and they have a fever, how is my body going to respond to fever? Again, my hypothalamus is going to trigger these mechanisms of heat loss. Um, so I would rec um, recommend just kind of reviewing all of these ways that the body can release heat. Um, fever, though, fever is good, We want, an, um, but we don't want it to get out of control. And by out of control, I'm talking 103, 104, uh, 105. At that point, um, we have significant risk um, of damaging our cellular DNA. But fever isn't always a bad thing. It's how our body kind of attacks an infection. Um, so really, there's a lot of benefits to fever, especially this is kind of why when our pediatric population runs a low grade fever, we're really not gonna treat it because that fever itself is going to do more than enough at combating the pathogen. When we talk about our ICP, our ICP, our normal in, uh, intracranial pressure is one to one, one to 15. Remember, our brain is a closed box, meaning that if I get hurt on my arm, the organs and tissues can kind of expand so that it can swell, but our brain cannot. It's a closed box, so something has to give. Usually, our um, cerebrospinal fluid will displace first, but sometimes that's not enough. So think about any of the causes of increased intracranial pressure, tumors, cerebral edema, excessive cerebrospinal fluid, hemorrhage? What about concussions? If someone has trauma to the brain, that can cause swelling. And again, something's got to give. So um, we're really concerned that as our brain expands, it's going to start squishing important parts of the body. Um, our respiratory control center, our autonomic nervous system control center, etc. So kind of focusing on these signs and symptoms, you know, altered levels of consciousness. If my if I was assessing my patient in the morning and I knew they had a concussion and they were alert and oriented and now I go back and they have no clue where they're at, I'm concerned that my brain is swelling and I need to call the provider right away. Um, when it starts to get extremely bad is when we start seeing alterations in respiratory pattern. Um, posturing, review your decorbrit versus your decerebrate. And then you start seeing issues with the eyes. Specifically, the um, worst, if you will, um, signs and symptoms of our increased ICP is our Cushing's triad. What is this? My patient is going to be um, hypertensive, but they're going to have a very low pulse and very low respiration. So I would review that too. Um, on the topic of things that can cause increased intracranial pressure, our coup contra coup injury especially, this is a type of concussion, um, but essentially what happens is it's kind of like whiplash, where the brain hits the front, or it could even hit the back of the brain, and it rebounds and injures another area of the brain. So kind of knowing your coup injury, that's your initial injury, and then the contra coup is kind of the um, whole concept of an object in motion will stay in motion. Um, 
so it's that rebound effect. So we're really concerned that now there's swellings on different hemispheres of the brain, so I'm really concerned. Another disease process that can cause um, increased intracranial pressure is going to be our encephalitis. This is usually caused by a viral infection, um, specifically H, um, HSV-1. But basically, what happens is there's an infection that crosses the blood-brain barrier and results in an increased ICP. Usually, these patients will first present with mild flu-like symptoms from the infection, but as it kind of progresses, they're going to start having confusion. That's like our, our number one, altered mental status, level of consciousness, etc. And then now I'm concerned for seizures, issues with senses, movement, etc. because my brain is kind of being ticked off. And um, the brain is very finicky, which is why these issues are really important. So um, this doesn't include uh, brain swelling, but it also, it, it really does affect kind of our neurosensory system. So what is ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease? Essentially, this is a disease that is fatal. It has no cure. Usually the prognosis is about three to five years, but essentially there's massive degeneration of our motor neurons. Um, we no longer have that mind to muscle communication, um, no mind to muscle movement. So essentially, I, if I wanted to go pick up my water bottle, my mind is telling me to go pick up my water bottle, but my body, my body just can't do it. And this is what happens. So with these patients, eventually they do um, die because their respiratory muscles can no longer work because we're not making that motor neuron connection. And that's how these patients die, unfortunately. Um, in three to five years. Uh, what's really upsetting about this disease, um, aside from that there is no cure, is that the patient's cognition remains the same, so they are completely aware of everything that's happening to them. So this can pose a major psychiatric issue, patients at risk for anxiety, depression, et cetera, so kind of watching that too. Um, but just really know with this one that there's no cure, and usually the paralysis starts kind of at the fingertips and it's slowly going to creep up, slowly move in until it gets to that respiratory, um, the respiratory muscles. And then they just can't make that uh, communication to expand, contract, inhale, exhale, etc. So myasthenia gravis, little tidbit, this is not Graves' disease. Graves' disease is something different. Um, but essentially with myasthenia gravis, it's an a acquired chronic autoimmune disease. Basically, um, antibodies attack our acetylcholine receptors. Uh, the function of acetylcholine, it really helps with triggering neuron firing in the neuromuscular junction. So if I have issues with my acetylcholine um, receptors, I'm going to have all sorts of issues with just my muscles doing what they're not supposed to be doing. Um, so really it's going to worsen our muscle use. So with myasthenia gravis, think just muscle issues. Usually muscles in the eyes, face, mouth, throat, throat, and neck are affected first. Um, I really like this osmosis photo at the top. Um, it really kind of puts everything into, um, detail. I would note, um, a major complication of myasthenia gravis is our myasthenic crisis. So usually myasthenia gravis, uh, gravis can be managed with immunosuppressant therapy, but what happens if my patient forgets to take a dose? This is why we have to be careful with medications. If my patient is under medicated, they might have a worsening of their symptoms, an, ex an exacerbation, if you will, um, and my number one concern is that there's going to be decreased respiratory function because, again, this is an issue with those skeletal muscles, muscles of the body, my lungs are a muscle, my respiratory muscles, my intercostal muscles, et cetera. So just kind of knowing why we're concerned um, with a myasthenic crisis. Multiple sclerosis is another um, immune disease, but this causes an inflammatory response. Um, so essentially with multiple sclerosis is the body attacks our myelin sheath. What does our myelin sheath do? It helps in the transmission of nerve impulses. 
So think of it as the mind lynch thesis are your slip and slide. Uh, motor neuron goes and it can go right across the axon. Easy peasy, no issues, which is why I can tell myself I'm going to pick up my water bottle and I can do it nice and fast. There's no thought about it. But if my body attacks the myelin sheath, there can now be these plaques. So now as the um, electrical impulse is traveling across that axon, it hits a roadblock. And it's not as quick, not as efficient. So I might go to pick up my water and it, it might take me a little bit or there might be an issue. I might have all sorts of problems. Um, so there's an issue with conduction. So usually these patients are going to have paresthesia. They're going to have tingling, weakness, impaired gait. Think sensory issues. Multiple sclerosis causes sensory issues, um, which is why urinary incontinence is a big one. My patient's not going to be able to literally sense if they have to go or not. So there's multiple different types of multiple sclerosis, um, relapsing, remitting, et cetera. Not important for you guys at this point, but just know that if my patient experiences an exacerbation, what happens during that exacerbation? My body goes into overdrive attacking those myelin sheaths. And once the myelin sheath is gone, it's gone. It can't be regenerated. So if my patient has a really bad exacerbation, they're not gonna be able to go back to their baseline function. So I would just kind of review, this really does affect like the hands, the skin and our muscles. Alzheimer's on the other hand, um, this is an issue specifically just with the brain. Essentially, there's a buildup of plaques in the brain. It can be um, categorized as a subtype of dementia, um, but again, not super important. Just really know that there's some issue with acetylcholine and there's an efficiency. We talked about the importance of acetylcholine earlier, um, but essentially these patients are going to have like a gradual muscle loss, or sorry, gradual memory loss. They're going to have a lack of environmental awareness, et cetera. So the main focus for our Alzheimer's patients is keeping them safe. So these Alzheimer patients, they might not remember people anymore and they might start landing random people into their houses. Not good. They might forget where they're at. They might have driven to the grocery store and then completely forgot why they're there, where they are and how to get home. Um, so we're really concerned for safety. So a lot of our um, patient care is going to be focused on safety and education. Um, Neural tube defects, this goes into our pediatric. Um, just really know that at some point in child development in utero, some parts of the brain and spinal cord just didn't completely get closed off. Um, it's an issue with closure. I would recommend knowing spina bifida, occulta, meningocele, myelomeningocele. What's worse? What's good? Well, None of them are really good, but spina bifida occulta is mild. But when we talk about myelomeningocele, now we have actual pieces of the spinal cord sticking out of their back. Um, and usually these kiddos will um, be wheelchair bound. They might have issues um, later in life. So just kind of keeping that in mind as well. Congenital hydrocephalus is another issue. Um, again, back to increased intracranial pressure, it can cause that. Um, so essentially, there's increased cerebrospinal fluid building up in the brain. It's having an issue getting flushed out. Um, and then there's also an enlargement of the ventricles. So these kids just have increased skull, et cetera. Usually, if it happens kind of in utero um, or after utero when the skull is still forming, it, it can still expand to accommodate, um, but we're still concerned. Um, so really these kiddos are gonna have a lot of issues um, with kind of the head. You're gonna see these bulging of eyes. They're gonna have like what's called like their sun setting eyes where they're gonna have that like white sclera above the pupil, unusually large head. And kind of like I talked about, if it occurs after the skull has been formed in utero, um, the baby is going to die in utero. But if it happens early enough, while the skull is still kind of malleable, um, we, can, we can actually have a, a healthy baby. And usually the treatment for this is they're going to get a shunt. And we talk about that more in your women, children, family class. Um, but this is kind of the patho behind that. So unit five. 
this also talks a little bit about endocrine. So um, there's usually two types of pituitary dysfunction. There's either an inappropriate amount of hormone delivered to the cell. Think about um, diabetes insipidus. We have an insufficient amount of ADH. Or there can be an issue with the target cell. Too little too many receptors. When we talk about talking, when we, sorry, when we talk about hypothyroidism, some cases can be an issue with the target cell. So just kind of understanding that um, it can either be a problem with production or um, response. So our pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is kind of in the middle of the brain uh, below the hypothalamus and it has a very important function. It's got a lot of important functions, but we're really gonna focus on producing ADH. Again, antidiuretic hormone, anti-peeing hormone. This is going to help regulate the levels of water in the body. There's two main categories of alterations in pituitary function. We have our syndrome of inappropriate ADH or our diabetes insipidus. So what is SIADH? This is an issue, again, with the uh, posterior pituitary. Essentially, my brain keeps secreting ADH, even when I don't need it. Remember when we talked about, usually when the um, body senses an issue or a drop in blood pressure, it will then be released from the brain. But with SIADH, there's actually something going on with the brain, sands my regular blood pressure levels that my brain just keeps secreting this. It's usually caused by tumors, certain medications, um, disorders, et cetera. But when you think of SIADH, think that there's a problem with the brain. So ADH, if I have so much ADH, I'm gonna have so much fluid retention because all that ADH is doing exactly what it should, holding water. And that's great, that's fine and well if I have low blood pressure, but what if my blood pressure was fine and all of a sudden I just keep increasing fluid? My body is holding on to so much fluid. I'm concerned for a hypertensive crisis because fluid makes up like our circulating blood. So if we have extra fluid, we're gonna have an increase in blood pressure so I'm very concerned. Also, we talked about our sodium imbalances before when we, talk, when we talked about our packet of crystallite. Well, this is the bathtub in the crystallite. I'm going to have hyponatremia, massive hyponatremia. And we kind of talked about earlier the unfortunate signs and symptoms and complications of hyponatremia. So I'm really concerned with these patients. So they're going to have water intoxication, hyponatremia. They're going to be big and bloated. Signs and symptoms, how would we assess if my patient might have SIADH? Well, fluid overload, weight gain, tachycardia, et cetera. But as a nurse, how would I assess? Well, I would, of course, want to know what their weight is. Did they all of a sudden gain five pounds in a day? Did they gain two pounds in a day? I'm really, really concerned. Uh, we can check for pitting edema. Um, does my patient feel short of breath? Um, getting a really good uh, fluid and electrolyte RCBC panel to kind of know what's going on. Um, but we're also really concerned for seizures. Why? That increased blood pressure is not good and then the hyponatremia is also not good. Puts my patient at risk for seizures. What's interesting about these patients is they're gonna have a really small urinary output, and whatever they put out is gonna be very concentrated. Why? The body's excreting some electrolytes via the urine, some extra components, extra chemicals via the urine, but it wants to hold whatever water it can. So that's why they're gonna have really dilute urine. And this is not good because that extra blood pressure is gonna put extra stress and extra strain on my patient's body. On the opposite, we have our diabetes insipidus. Think dry inside. My body is producing little to no ADH. Therefore, my body is simply not going to be able to hold on to water. So whatever goes in is gonna go right out. So these patients are gonna 
really, when you assess them, they're going to be very dehydrated. How do we assess for dehydration? That dry skin turgor, they're going to be really, really thirsty. Um, but what's interesting is that even though these patients appear dehydrated, they are putting out mass amounts of very dilute urine. Why? Their body simply cannot hold on to the water. Um, usually there's two causes. It can be um, neurogenic or nephrogenic. Abby, you have a question? Did, um, for the SIADH, did you say that it was also diluted urine or concentrated? So it's very concentrated urine. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So with our diabetes insipidus, it can be neurogenic or nephrogenic. When we think neurogenic, think there's a problem with the brain. My brain is simply not secreting ADH. Or it can be nephrogenic, meaning my body is secreting ADH but my kidneys aren't recognizing it. Why? Because ADH acts on the kidneys. So I might simply be producing ADH, but if my kidneys aren't responding to that, then it would be a nephrogenic issue. When we think nephro, think kidneys. So essentially these hot patients are gonna be so dehydrated, but still putting out so much diluted uh, urine. So um, for treatment for this, these patients, we're just going to have to give them what they are lacking from ADH. ADH is our human vasopressor. So we're going to give them a synthetic vasopressin to help the body hold onto that water. Um, whereas, I'll go back to our SIADH, um, our treatment for this, number one, we're going to restrict fluids on our patient. They're not going to, well, I'm not going to give them more water. They have way too much water, okay? And I'm going to put them on a diuretic to hopefully flush out all of this extra water. Um, and we'll know it's effective if their blood pressure drops, if they start peeing more, and if they have weight loss. So with our SIADH and our DI patients, daily weighs are very, very important because it's going to be indicative of not only is my treatment working, but if my patient gained so much weight, that's fluid that they gained. Um, so I'm thinking SIADH or if they keep peeing and peeing and peeing and they're putting out 400, like 400 to 500 mLs an hour and they keep losing weight, I'm concerned for DI. So just kind of knowing um, those nursing considerations there. So uh, diabetes mellitus, it can be categorized into our type 1 or a type 2 diabetes. Um, there can be acute and chronic complications. When we talk about our acute complications, we're really talking about our episodes of hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, and our diabetic ketoacidosis. With diabetic ketoacidosis, essentially there is a complete lack of insulin and my body is producing so much blood sugar that it cannot metabolize, that it cannot break down. So my body resorts to breaking down fats instead of carbs. Remember, carbs are our number one um, source for energy. But if my body simply, because these patients, carbohydrates are sugars. Without insulin, they can't absorb sugar. So they're going to break down fat. And when my body breaks down fat, it's going to release ketones that will be excreted in the urine. Additionally, these ketones are acidic, so they're going to have metabolic acidosis. And that's kind of how you can pin the two um, together if you go all the way back to our ABGs. When we talk about our chronic complications, these are um, usually result from chronic poor management or unfortunately just how the disease progresses. Usually um, our chronic complications are a bit more common with our type 2 diabetics, um, but they also do affect type 1 diabetics. So what are my chronic complications? These patients are at increased risk of infection. Uh, when we talk about macrovascular disease, think about the heart, the organs, etc., that at risk for cardiovascular disease, stroke, um, peripheral vascular disease, et cetera. When we talk about microvascular, that's going to be our diabetic nephropathy, diabetic neuropathy, diabetic retinopathy. We're really concerned with our diabetic neuropathy because these patients might not be able to feel 
um, their feet. That's a big one. So diabetic foot care is um, really important. Now we get to talk about uh, Graves' disease. Graves' disease is a type of hyperthyroidism, but the cause of it is an autoimmune cause, where essentially our body produces antibodies against the TSH receptors on the thyroid gland. So we talked a little bit about um, kind of how the brain works. And essentially, my body releases a thyroid stimulating hormone if my body senses a need for thyroid hormones to be produced. So thyroid hormone, um, sorry, thyroid stimulating hormone acts on our thyroid gland in our neck. What's the function of our thyroid gland? It produces T3 and T4, which are our thyroid hormones that give us energy. But if my body has antibodies against my TSH receptors, it's going to attack my thyroid gland. And now my thyroid gland is getting all of this attention. Hyperplasia is occurring. And now I'm going to have just increased synthesis of T3 and T4. Now my body is producing so much thyroid hormone. What's the issue with this? Well, now my patient is going to have an increase in energy, an increase in metabolism. They're going to have that increased heart rate. Um, their whole body is just sped up. Everything is happening so fast. All of my organs are going crazy. That's why, like, diarrhea is a big side effect of this is because my um, intestines are just going crazy. My digestive system is going so fast. Um, they're going to have that increase in blood pressure, et cetera. They're going to feel very, very hot. They're going to have an increase in temperature, et cetera. How you kind of differentiate Graves' disease is the body recognizes it has way too much T3 and T4. Therefore, my body is not going to produce thyroid stimulating hormone because that's my body's way of saying, I have enough, please stop. But with these um, patients, they just keep secreting T3 and T4. And like we put in the chat, Wendy Williams, Wendy Williams, the talk show host, she's been very open about her Graves' disease. Um, one of the signs and symptoms, thyroid eye disease, that exophthalmos, they're going to have that big bulging eye. So that's a really big one as well. And they're going to be very hot, very sweaty, and everything is just fed up. So uh, Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome um, really can be kind of categorized into Cushing's disease versus Cushing syndrome. Um, basically, there's an issue with chronic excess cortisol, but we have to find the cause. Is it because of ACTH activating our body to produce cortisol? Or did my patient or was my patient on long-term glucocorticoids? And when they got off, they had this massive rebound effect. So those are some things to keep in mind. But essentially, chronic excess cortisol. The patients are going to present with some truncal obesity, moon face, buffalo hump, glucose intolerance, and protein intolerance as well. Um, some pharmacological reasons, like I talked about, excess use of steroids or if we abruptly stop taking steroids. That's why all steroid medication must be tapered off. Because if you've been receiving an excess of steroids, the body got used to it, all of a sudden you take all that away, well, what's my body gonna do? It's gonna produce a lot of steroids really fast. Steroids, cortisol. And then our Cushing's disease, that's results from that excess secretion of ACTH. The function of ACTH, it stimulates the production of cortisol. Unit six, and that's kind of when we talk about blood. So when we're talking about anemias, anemias can really be classified by size, shape, and color. They can also be categorized by how much hemoglobin they um, have. Remember the function of hemoglobin? Hemoglobin allows the red blood cell to deliver oxygen. So it's kind of like our car, if you will. It picks up the oxygen, it, del it travels on the red blood cell, it deposits it wherever it's needed, and then it also picks up carbon dioxide and brings it back to the lungs. So hemoglobin is very, very important. Um, it can also be classified by what's the cause. 
anemia of blood loss. Maybe I had a massive trauma patient with a massive hemorrhage, et cetera. Um, when we talk about normocytic, microcytic, um, and macrocytic, this is referring to size. So if I have macrocytic anemia, my red blood cells are just really, really large, and that can pose problems for circulation. When we talk about hypochromic, normochromic, and hyperchromic, we're thinking about hemoglobin content. So if my patient has a hypochromic anemia, I'm concerned that they have decreased hemoglobin content. Well, what's the big deal with hemoglobin? Well, we talked about it. It's really important in transferring oxygen. So if I have hypochromic anemia, I'm concerned for hypoxia, hypoxemia. So just kind of keeping that in mind. So what is polycythemia vera? Well, let's talk about polycythemia first. Polycythemia or polycythemia is an umbrella term for erythrocytosis, the overproduction of erythrocytes. Erythrocytes, those are our blood cells. Polycythemia vera, though, is an overproduction of erythrocytes, but we know what the cause is. And what's the cause? It's caused by a type of slow growing blood cancer. Essentially, this blood cancer causes the bone marrow to produce too many RBCs, even with low erythropoietin levels. Erythropoietin is a hormone that stimulates the production of erythrocytes. So these patients, physiologically, their body's not telling them they need more erythrocytes. This cancer is still causing them to produce it anyway. So now why am I concerned? Well, if I have too many red blood cells, I'm concerned that I have an increase in blood volume. This causes a viscosity, which causes clogging, not good. This thick, sticky blood is gonna increase their hematocrit levels. And without treatment, this patient is at risk for a blood clot or a hemorrhage. So just keeping that in mind. And kind of knowing your lab values of what's our normal RBC count. And going from there. Pernicious anemia, this is another type of anemia. Essentially, these red blood cells are very large, but they lack intrinsic factor. So what type of anemia would this be? This would be a macrocytic anemia. Um, think big size. But these red blood cells lack intrinsic factor. What does intrinsic factor do? It helps our body absorb B12. And if we can't absorb B12, we're going to become B12 deficient. So some signs and symptoms are really going to have an inflamed, smooth, red tongue, jaundice, weakness, paresthesias, um, uh, the um, abdominal part um, kind of got cut off, but they're going to have like a... Um, a loss of abdominal kind of control where they're going to have diarrhea, et cetera, um, pain and weight loss. Why? Because these patients aren't able to hold on to whatever nutrients that they're, they're receiving. Infectious monocleosis. This is a benign lymph uh, lymphoproliferative syndrome. It's usually caused by our Epstein-Barr virus. So that's really important. Infectious mononucleosis is also called like the kissing disease. Why? Because it's just transmitted via saliva. Um, but it can be really painful for patients because they're going to have these massive swollen tonsils that are going to be red, inflamed, and it's not fun for them at all. And their lymph nodes are going to be really swollen. So overall, um, it's going to be pretty painful. So again, these patients are going to present with fatigue, fever, rash, and swollen glands. When we talk about classifying lymphomas, uh, lymphoma is essentially just cancer of the lymph. We separate it into Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Really the main difference in both is with our Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's gonna involve Reed-Sternberg cells. Usually these um, patients will have enlarged painless lymph nodes in our upper extremities, but we can really kind of pinpoint where it's at and they're, a little, they're malignant. 
Um, but usually they're not going to spread as fast as our non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And unfortunately, not non-Hodgkin's lymphoma has a um, poorer prognosis. So usually these are uh, more involved in our lymphatic system and our lymph can travel to anywhere in our body. So that's why with our non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we're really uh, concerned. Um, so just kind of remembering how do we differentiate? And if we know that maybe my patient has a tumor kind of in their neck, chest or, uh, or their spleen, and I know that they have lymphoma, I'm thinking that's Hodgkin's. Why? Because Hodgkin's, we can pretty much pinpoint it to kind of like the chest and above. Um, whereas our non-Hodgkin's, these kind of can spread anywhere. So if my patient with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma now has swollen lymph nodes, because um, we have lymph nodes kind of in the groin, that's kind of where we can pinpoint. So leukemia. Leukemia is cancer of the bone marrow. It's the function of our bone marrow. It helps produce all of our blood cells, white blood cells, red blood cells, et cetera. Um, they can be linked to genetics, but usually they're kind of, when we go back to our epigenetics, um, that puts them at risk. Um, another risk factor for leukemia is our trisomy 21 um, patients. We really don't know why this happens, um, but just know that really our trisomy 21, our Down syndrome um, kiddos are at risk for a lot of more rarer genetic diseases, um, et cetera. But our leukemias, they're pretty much our most common malignancy in childhood, um, meaning our most common cancer in childhood. So just kind of understanding the signs and symptoms of these, um, usually it responds pretty well to treatment, um, but just kind of knowing what's, what's our risk factors for that. Sickle cell anemia. So a little bit of history behind sickle cell anemia. So um, in African countries, essentially patients that happen to be sickle cell carriers were protected from malaria. Now, in order to have sickle cell disease, you have to have um, both genes because it's autosomal recessive. So autosomal recessive, if, if a patient is autosomal recessive and, and thus has the sickle cell anemia, they're at risk for some major issues, which we'll talk about in a minute. But if it's autosomal recessive and my patient is a carrier, they're not really going to present with these same signs and symptoms. Why? Because that's just not their, their genotype which is why it was beneficial um, to protect them against malaria. So that was kind of just a little, a little history about that. Um, but essentially there's just a mutation in the HPV gene. This causes our cells to become sickled, meaning they just can't travel as easily through the bloodstream, which can lead to uh, vasoocclusion. occlusion. Usually it's pretty uh, well managed, but um, not in cases of our sickle cell crisis. So sickle cell crisis is really categorized by sudden severe pain, usually in the hands, feet, and back. Um, these patients will also be nauseous, vomiting, um, et cetera. Usually it's brought on by our exacerbations, specifically hypoxia, acidosis, high altitudes, or dehydration. So if I know my patient with sickle cell anemia, um, recently traveled and now they ended up in the ER, I'm concerned for a sickle cell crisis. If we follow our ABCs, our airway breathing circulation, our treatment, number one, we're gonna start administering oxygen. We also know that a sickle cell crisis is brought on by dehydration. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna give them fluids, usually IV. These patients are also going to be in severe pain, so I'm going to promote pain management. So giving them medications, et cetera. Um, I like the little frog on the bottom. The treatment is hop to it, hydration, oxygenation, and pain relief. Immune thrombocytic purpura. This is... Um, Again, another autoimmune disease where our body's antibodies actually attacks our platelet. So my patient is going to have a platelet count less than our normal. 
review our normal. It's 150 to 400. So they're going to have a loss of platelets. What is the function of platelets? They help with blood clotting. Um, so I'm really now concerned. Possible causes, blood cancer, infection, Epstein-Var virus also puts these patients at risk, um, and any bone-related disease. So again, the lower the platelet count, the more severe bleeding my patient may have, even from minor trauma. They might nick themselves in the shower shaving, and now they have an uncontrollable bleed because the blood's just not going to clot, so it's going to just keep going. So what are we assessing for? Signs and symptoms. Hemorrhage from minor trauma. Easily, the my patients are going to bruise pretty easily. Um, spontaneous bleeding, severe bleeding. Um, we're going to try to use up whatever platelets we have left, but then they're going to have an even higher decrease in platelet count. Um, petechiae and purpura are very um, important, like hallmark symptoms, because if my patient now presents with petechiae and purpura, I'm concerned that it's going to progress for a major hemorrhage. So what am I going to do with these patients? I'm going to educate them on how to stop bleeds. I'm going to educate them to be safe, not using specific razors, um, and just being very, very careful. Under the concept of blood clotting, um, we have hemophilia. So hemophilia isn't an issue with the platelets. It's an actual issue with our clotting factors. Now, this is an X-linked recessive disorder, meaning if we go back to like kind of Mendel's box, you have the little r and the little r. But it's X-linked, meaning it's carried on the X chromosome. Males only have one X chromosome. So if they inherit just one faulty um, recessive mutation, they're going to have this disease. Whereas females usually are carriers because they have two X's. And as long as they have a dominant R, they could still have this recessive trait, but they're not going to present why this is an X-linked recessive disorder. So again, females usually are going to be our carriers, but they might always, sorry, they might not know their carriers um, until unfortunately they have children. And if they have a boy, their boy has hemophilia. So hemophilia can be categorized A, B, or C. Um, just knowing kind of what factor deficiency matches. Um, I would just recommend knowing, like again, hemophilia A is factor B, I, 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 um, eight, nine, et cetera. Um, but just know that no matter what, all of our patients are going to present with the same signs and symptoms. What excessive uncontrolled bleeding. They're, they're gonna have frequent nosebleeds, Again, minor trauma, heavy bruising, etc. I know we talked about anemia a little bit ago, but specifically in our pediatric population, this is our most common nutritional disorder. Kids can be picky. They might not want to eat certain foods. Um, so we're really concerned for iron deficiency anemia. Um, again, multiple causes. Usually it's uh, linked to diet. Sometimes issues with absorption, blood clot, uh, blood loss. As kids grow older, their need increases. So if they already had a poor diet in iron, now it's going to be worse. Um, and this is concerning because iron is very important for a healthy brain development. Um, but it's kind of hard to distinguish what's going on with our kids because they're not going to present with the same signs and symptoms. They're not going to be able to complain, I'm short of breath, I feel dizzy, I feel gross, I feel lethargic, etc. So it's really up to parents to kind of know what to look for if their child, if their child sorry, um, might have um, some iron deficiency anemia. So how do we tailor it to kids? Might be irritable, angry, they might have a lack of interest in play. They might be too tired to go kick around the ball. They might not be able to express that, but they're not going to be playing the same games they used to. Um, decreased activity tolerance, that kind of goes hand in hand with, you know, maybe not playing kickball with their friends. Um, also, we can kind of look for that sore or swollen tongue. And then pica. Pica isn't necessarily specific to just kids. 
Um, really anyone with iron deficiency anemia will have these weird cravings to eat random things. It can be dirt, it can be ice, anything, but they're just gonna have a craving to eat something that's not food, um, which can be a little bit difficult with kids because they'll kind of put everything in their mouths. Um, but just really, I would focus on that lack of interest in play where you notice your mom um, brings in their child into their e into the ER, they appear short of breath. The mom says she hasn't been playing as well as she used to, um, et cetera. And then you see that they're pale and pretty tachycardic. That would make me think that this is iron deficiency anemia. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna get a CBC, complete blood count. So that is all I have for you guys. I know it was a lot of information. Um, I do apologize for that, um, but I'm happy we were able to kind of go through it with the time allotted. I know your exam, I believe, isn't until um, next week. So um, I will be in for office hours on Monday and Wednesday from 12 to 3 or 1230 to 3 if you guys need anything. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop the recording. Does anyone have any questions? for me that I can help answer.